In this video, I'm going to show you three ways to scrape product data from Amazon. And at the end, I'll talk about a fourth way, which is probably the best way, but also the worst way uh, you'll see. So the first thing I've got on my screen is the obvious, the easy choice. This is request beautiful soup. We hard code our URL here. Uh, I've just shortened this. You can do this with Amazon URLs. We make our request to the server. We pass it with beautiful soup. And I've decided to export the item here in a dictionary with the name and the price. Now, the, import, the only important thing here is that you need to make sure you're specifying an actual user agent. Otherwise, you're not going to get the response back that you want. So if we run this, we'll get a dictionary back with this information where the name and the price here. Now you can of course get any information from the page and I've decided to use soup.select1 which is the CSS selectors op selector option for beautiful soup. You can of course use XPath or the standard find if you want to. The hardest part of any web scraping project is working at scale and one of the biggest issues you're going to face is IP banning. The best way around this is to use a high quality set of proxies like the ones from today's sponsor, IP Royal. So IP Royal will provide you with proxies that are designed to your specific use case. They offer high speed data center proxies for large throughput where stealth isn't such of a priority and static residential proxies from premium ISPs that are not shared. Then that can give you secure access to shopping and streaming services to other countries. But for scaling up projects like the ones that I'm working on now, I'd highly recommend checking out their Royal Residential Proxies with a global pool of 100% genuine residential IPs. These are offered with the ability to auto-rotate for you, making integration into your projects new and old really, really easy. Or you can use the API access to instantly change the IP if you've got one that you want to hold on to a little bit longer or move on. There's unlimited concurrent sessions too, so you can go nuts with your async and get as much data as quickly as possible. So IP Royal have also given me a code to offer you 50% off your Royal Residential Proxy order. So check out the link below and use code JWR50 for that discount. Now the next one that I've done is a bit more complicated and as you can see I've split it out into different functions. So my main thinking was that I wanted to open the ASINs from a file. I wanted to split out making the request and extracting the data and then I wanted to save it to a new file. The main interesting thing here that I've done is I've actually amended the session object for requests slightly. I've added a few things in. I've created a function to um, return the session that I've modified um, just so it's easier to deal with. You can see that I'm creating the session here. Now this is one of the most great, which is one of the best parts about this is you can do session.headers.update, which means any header that we put in here will be automatically added to any request that's made when you use this session. So we don't have to do the headers is equal to headers on all of our requests, which is pretty cool. The second thing is we're adding in a hook on response, which is giving us some uh, extra logging options in this case. What this means is that what this code here will execute every time a response comes back from anywhere. Now we can do loads of cool stuff with this and I'm gonna cover that in another video. In this case, I'm just logging the URL and the status code just so I can see what's happening. I'll cover logging in just a minute, but we're gonna move on to just opening the file. So I've created a new function. Again, I'm logging it. And all I'm doing is opening and creating a a list of ASINs from a CSV file, which I'll just show you the CSV file looks like this. The next thing is we're going to make the request. So I've decided to pass in my client, which I've, this is my session, the base URL, which I've created in my main function, which I'll show you, and the ASIN. Now from these, we can actually construct the full URL. So this thing here will look like this when it gets sent for the request. I'm doing some basic request exception handling and logging that out if we get an error. And I'm just checking that the response code is 200. Uh, this is not that essential here though because of what we're doing here. Now you'll notice that I'm actually returning out here the response and an ASIN. So this is a tuple that I'm returning. So the reason why I've done this is because I still want to use this ASIN string in the next function, which is extracting the data. So we see I'm passing in my tuple here. So this is just some type hints in Python. Then I'm creating the soup uh, with the re actual response data. And I'm specifying here that the ASIN was actually the 
first index of that tuple. I've done that here, so just when I make the item, it just looks a bit neater. You could, of course, put this in here. Again, the same selectors, select one, CSS selectors, which I prefer, and then another logging line, and then we're returning this item. Now, what I noticed that when, if you pass in a ASIN that doesn't exist, you don't get a 404, you just get a screen back that says, hey, there's nothing here, which is quite common, but it does actually count as a 200 response. So what I've done is I've said that if we find an attribute error, because that is the error that we get when we try to actually pass information that doesn't exist with this here. So I'm going to log that I found no selectors for this ASIN, so we know that this one is not good, but I am going to return it out. So not only does it appear in our log file, but in our output file as well, our output CSV, we get the ASIN, so it's going to match here. You'll see this one is a fake one, but it's also going to say no data. So we can clearly see what we're getting. So we're going to try to do it properly, get the data. If that doesn't work with this error, which is the one we're going to get, we return this out here. Then we just basically open our results list and save it all here. Now let's take a quick look at the main function. So as I said, I'm using basic logging. Now to, you, to log in Python, you really only need this line and then add in these logging.info or whatever level of warning you want. Now I really recommend if you're going to be writing code that you're going to be running somewhere else on a server or uh, just maybe on your own machine, but at different times, or anything even if it's just more than once or twice that you add logging in rather than print statements it just makes it so much easier i've added bookends to my logging.info file just for clarity so when i'm doing it you absolutely don't need to do that here's my results list i'm going to save everything to then i'm creating my http session i've actually called it client here should maybe have called it session and setting the base url opening the file which is from our function that we created saving that to ASIN. So this is going to be a list. Because this is a list, we can loop through, make the request, passing in the client, which is our session, the base URL, which we've got here, and the ASIN. If we get no HTML back, i.e. we hit this um, up here, we're just going to log out this. Uh, and otherwise, we're going to append what we extract out of the HTML to our results list and then save that to CSV just like this. I've got if name is equal to main at the bottom here, this is just good practice, so this will all run. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to run this and I'll show you the output and the log file that we get. Here's the log, um, and as you can see, uh, it started to go through, and this will actually update sporadically as the, uh, as the data gets added to it. Um, but we can see straight away, let me move this down, that we have our starting new, our opening ASINs log, all with that timestamp, because that's what we specified here, this timestamp here, and then scrape successfully. Here's the URL and the status code. Now this has come from our hook we put in up here. So this is this working. Here's one that failed, no matching selectors, and it's just moved on. So if I looked at the output now, we should have our results.csv file. Here's the data that we've got, our ASIN, the, the data, and here's the one that says no data. I find that trying to split out my code into these sorts of functions just makes it easier to tweak it and understand what's going on. And obviously when you've got it in functions, you can reuse parts as you need. This was the second way, which is I want to say a little bit more complicated, but nothing in here is overly complex. So if you're getting towards this point in your learning, I definitely recommend trying to take some of this out and working with it and understanding it. The third way is our scrapey project. So I'm just going to close these files out. We don't need them now. And I'm going to open up my scrapey project. And we're going to open up again the, the ASINs here. And we're going to open up the items file because we've modified that and also the products spider here. So this is the main spider. So this is gonna be actually take less time to write than the one that I did before. That's because we are using the Scrapey project and all the boilerplate that comes with it and all of the functionality. Now that is one of the absolute benefits that Scrapey brings to you. But it also has the downsides of you get all of the extra code that you may or may not need, might make your project heavier, and it's also not code that you've written. So you, if you wanted to be really exact and precise for your specific use case, then you don't necessarily need this. However, 
Scrapey is a great choice for almost all uh, web scraping projects. So I'll start with the items and all I've done here is I've created a class of product Scrapey item and I'm saying that we have two fields. These two fields then take in an input processor and an output processor. Now this is basically just what I kind of a bit like the request and response hooks that I showed you as in when we pass in data into this product here we basically run these functions on it. Remove tags has come from HTML uh, W3 lib. Um, remove white space is one that I've created here. So all we've done is we take the value and we do dot strip. Now this just means that we don't have to apply this function or apply dot strip to everywhere in, an, in our product items when they come out. The output processor is take first, which basically is the same as taking the first item because it will return a list. So if you've ever used request HTML where we do first is equal to true, or if you've done select one or find rather than find all, that's what this is. So this is just some code that's being run on these I being run on these fields when we put it into these items. The main spider here, then we're importing in the item loader because we're going to be using that to put the actual information into the items. It just gives you the options here of the map compose and take first, which we're making use of. Then I'm importing the items, the item product that I created. All we're saying is that this is the allowed domain. I recommend always doing this just in case you want to do any crawling. And what I'm doing is I'm saying that we're going to do start requests. We're not using start URLs. We're doing start requests because this will happen every time because you see we have yield. Then we're going to open the ASIN CSV file, which is the same as the one I looked at before. And we're basically going to create a scrapey request for that CS that ASIN attached to this URL. Now this is just going to make that request happen. And that is going to call back to this pass function here. So what we're doing is we're creating our instance of item loader, which is going to effectively work on the product that we created in our items folder. Then we load that we do loader.addcss. Now you can use XPath as well. We're going to say the name of the field that we want to put it in. So it's name and then the selector. Now, because we've done all of this here, we don't need to worry about doing dot get or text or anything like that. It's going to do it all for us. Then we're going to yield out the loader item that we've actually done. So this is going to do a lot for us in that respect. Let me open up the terminal and we need to then do scrapey crawl and products. Do I call it product or products? Product spider, it's called products here. This is the name we do. And then we'll do dash O and we'll do output.csv. And that is going to basically run through, scrape all those URLs, see how fast it was. Scrapey is run on the Twisted Framework, which is inherently async. So we were able to do that so much faster. We can scroll up and you can see here, it hits all these URLs, very similar to what I created myself in the more intermediate scraper. We have the price and the name again. Let's open up our project file, find the output.csv, and here it is, the name and the price. I didn't include the ASIN on this one. You could absolutely do that yourself as well if you wanted to. So I did mention a fourth way. Now, if you have an Amazon affiliate account and you have matched the criteria of a few sales in however long the period is, you actually get access to Amazon's product API that you can then use to make requests to all above board, no web scraping. Now this is the best way to do it, but it's also not the best way. Is <laughs> The best way is in that it's through all the official channels, it has all of the information that you could need on any of the products in there and it gives you your key and you can have your exact amount of requests per minute that you are allowed but the downside of course is that you need to meet that criteria because it's designed for people that are working through their affiliate system it's also not very pleasant to work with However, it is manageable. So all the code is going to be linked down below. And if you've got some good value out of this one, I think you're going to like this video here where we talk about a different web scraping method that works on sites that work slightly differently to Amazon.